Last week we started the series called A Healing Presence and the gist of this series has the reality that Jesus is our healing presence and as such we seek intimacy with him, that intimate relationship and when we do so our hearts will be healed and in return we can become a healing presence to others. It's an idea, it's a concept that we really need to work hard at internalizing because here's the deal. We cannot offer to others what we don't have ourselves. I think a good example of this is last year, September 2018, uh, my, my parents bought my family and I to Disney World. And this was going to be the first time that my youngest, all my kids, were going to be flying. And so we're, we're sitting in the plane, and thankfully their excitement about going to Disney seems to kind of override, you know, the fear of, of the first time flying. And we're sitting in the plane, and you know how it goes. They, you start taxiing out, or maybe probably before then, I can't remember, at one point, the flight attendants begin to go through this emergency checklist, right, to tell you all these things that have to be done, and they get to the point where they're talking about the oxygen masks and what needs to happen. And I remember the first time that I heard that, uh, I disagreed with what they said because they tell you that if you have children with you, that you need to put the mask on first before you put it on the kids. Because there's, it's a very natural, instinctive thing within us, right, to immediately want to go to grab the kids and to try to take care of them. But what we don't understand is that when there is an emergency and you're, you know, thousands of feet in the air, you may not have the opportunity to do that unless you take care of yourself first. And so they instruct you to take the oxygen, oxygen mask and to put it on your face first, and then you'll be able to take care of the kids around you because if there's an emergency, well, you might pass out. You may not have the oxygen that you need to take care of those sitting next to you. And that makes sense. And in the same way, in the same way, if we ourselves are not pursuing this intimate relationship with Jesus, if our hearts are not being healed, if we're not going through this process of transformation, we ourselves will not be able to become the healing presence to others. So you can't give what you don't have. And in fact, the, the backbone of this series is all about our need to pursue this intimate relationship with God. So what do we mean by intimacy? Well, intimacy is, well, it's a different kind of relationship. It's a specific type of relationship. In fact, we might say it this way. Intimacy is when you are truly known and you, are truly, and you truly know someone else. Let me say that again. When you are truly known and you truly know someone else. That is, you see beyond the facade and the image that this person wants to present to the rest of the world. You see beyond that. See, an intimate relationship, when we are in an intimate relationship with someone, we're in this relationship that is really from the depths of our hearts. It's in light of our darkest secrets, right? And all of our chaos and all of our issues, all those things are there. But in spite of that, right? In spite of that, that relationship is at the seat of our hearts. That's what an intimate relationship is. See, but most of our relationships, if I might paint a broad brush, most of our relationships are lived out on the fringes of reality. What do I mean by that? Well, you have reality. I and mean, let's just say reality is all this back here. See, all this right here is the real you. That's what's really going on inside of you. And you may not even know what that is yourself. All this right here is your issues and the root of your issues and your problems. All this right here is where you love from. 
It's, it's a result of, of your experiences and being formed by your experiences. All this right here is the real you, the real reality. And maybe starting right here. See, this is the image that we want to portray. This is how we want the world to see us. This is what we want the world to think about us. And behind it are all the walls and all the things that we use to prop up this image. And when we interact with the world, when we interact with people, this is the reality that we seek to portray. And this is where we live, on the fringes of real reality. See, because reality is really back here. The real thing, the real you, the real part of where we need to live is right here. But we're too busy propping up and creating and cultivating this thing right here. This right here. Intimate relationships, they tear down all of this. They look beyond all of that. Think about if you've ever been in an intimate relationship with someone that has truly known them, right? You see beyond the image that they try to, in fact, you might not even be aware of what the image is that they're trying to portray to the rest of the world. You might have got a glimpse of that when you, when you first met them, and then you get to know them, right? And that image disappears. And before you know it, you know the, trill, the, 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 the real them. You know the true person. You know who they really are. You get to understand their secrets. You get to understand what's really going on, what really drives them. And when you see them, you see the real person, not just what maybe they want to portray to the world. And that relationship you have with them, that's from back here. That's right here. See, in, in an intimate relationship with God is pursuing a life where we live from here. And you might say, well, I thought God, God knows me. He knows who I really am. Yeah, but do you? Do you? Not just do you know who you are, but do you truly know God? For while you might be truly known, do you truly know and an intimate relationship with God, as we pursue that, we're pursuing to truly know God. And we're pursuing it in light of all of this. In fact, Scripture talks about this intimate relationship with God and this pursuit of intimacy. Jesus, at the end of his life, prays this prayer in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. He says this. Now, pay attention. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify the Son, that the Son might glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, pay attention, to give eternal life to all you have given him. Underline this phrase. And this is eternal life. Are you paying attention? That they know you. This is eternal life. That they know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Of interest is this. The Greek word for know there is gnosko. And here's the thing. When the object is a person, that word is connected to a personal relationship every time. Every time. We're talking about an intimate relationship where the person who is known and the person, the person you know, they're important. They're of value. And Jesus says, notice what Jesus says, this is eternal life. That you what? You know the Father. You know God. We're talking, that's intimacy. We're talking about pursuit of an intimate relationship where you really know the Father. Now, think about it this way. Being in the presence of God. 
becoming like Moses in the presence of God. You know, where he just like glowed. And he had to like hide the light. Imagine that knowing. Imagine what that was like. Jesus says, that's eternal life. When we can truly know. And in truly knowing, there's intimacy. And we're here to pursue it. The pursuit of this intimate relationship with God. That is why Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, so that people would have a deeper knowing of God. Your translation might say knowledge. In fact, it's why James explains in James chapter 4, verse 8, if we draw near to God, notice what he says, he will draw near to us. In fact, this is, a, this is a concept that you're going to see throughout Scripture, this idea of us turning to God and he is turning to us. In fact, I love this. You look at Zechariah 3.1, Malachi 3.7, where specifically, this is, this, is, this is cool. God, see, people have turned away from God, okay? And he is pursuing after them. That's why the messenger is actually sent, because God is pursuing after them. See, it's not this picture that we pursue God, then he starts paying attention to us. Like, no, 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 no. God's already, he's already, he already, he already knows, right? He's, he's already chasing after. So he's chasing after. That's why the messengers are sent. And the messenger says this. Look, all you have to do is return to God. That is, turn to God. And he will do what? Return to you. Do you see the picture? Two coming together. What's the picture there? What is the picture? It's intimate. In fact, the word gnosko is oftentimes used to refer to the union between a man and a woman. We're talking about intimacy. An intimacy that touches to the depths of knowing. Of you being known and knowing the other. So there's this constant picture of not just God pursuing, but saying, listen, all you have to do is turn. You turn to me, I will turn to you, and then we will have what? This intimacy. In fact, John 14, 23, Jesus said, again, if anyone loves me, he will do what? Keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will what? We will come to him and make our home with him. See, there is this real sense of intimacy that is found within Scripture that we can have with God. But now the question is, how? How do we pursue this intimate relationship? We talked a lot about this last week. We've, we've talked, we're always talking about this, the fact that Jesus came Right, So that we can have that connection, that we can understand what's happening, the reality of what God is bringing about, that we can have with him. And Jesus provides the way. We, we, we get that, we understand that, right? But we, we look at this pursuit of intimacy as just a one-time thing. We look at this pursuit of intimacy as it's, it's done, uh, one and done. That's it. We're just waiting for whatever it is we think we're waiting for. But no, 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 no. This pursuit of this... Look, look, I'm not sure that your spouse would be married to you right now if they knew all the intimate details of who you are in the very beginning. Would you agree? See, that process, that pursuit is what prepared them to be with who you are today. And in fact, it's what allows us to see beyond all the mess and the muck and see What's beautiful? What's made in the image of God stuff? This pursuit of this intimate relationship with God is a process. It is, it is, in fact, Jesus gave us examples of what this looks like. He himself did it. His disciples wanted to know more about it. That's why they asked him, hey, teach us to pray. So it's a process. It's an ongoing thing. But the question is, the question is, how do we pursue it now? Like, what is this relationship supposed to be looking like? I think the answer is found in some Old Testament scripture. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 15. 
I want us to be there just for a moment here. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse number 15. Let me, let me set this up just, just very briefly. There's a huge backstory to this. We won't go into all of that, but here's the thing. Here, here, here it is. This message, this verse that we're going to read, is wisdom that has been ingrained in stone. It's presented during a time where Israel is actually seeking for protection from Egypt. In fact, they bypass God, not even concerned about what his plan might be for their circumstances, what his will might be for what they need to do. They're not interested in what God has to say here. They've kind of taken matters into their own hands, and they've busied themselves with getting prepared to be protected by Pharaoh. That's Isaiah 30. Look at verse 1. Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine. Who make an alliance, but not of my spirit. In other words, it's not my plan. I wouldn't, in fact, in fact, God goes, I wouldn't, there's no way I would ever plan that. I would never advise for you to do that. In fact, that's totally, that would be totally against what I advise for you to do. Then he says in verse 2, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction. (laughs) You set out to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. In other words, they didn't trust God enough to seek after his will and what he would want them to do. They weren't concerned about his guidance They were concerned about busying themselves to take care of matters, to to control things, to do what they thought was right in their own eyes. Plain and simple. That was the problem. They didn't trust God. Not enough to seek him. His protection, his guidance, his direction. And as a result, God says this in verse 8. Go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book. In other words, let's set this in stone right here. This one's for the records, folks. This one is for the books right now. He says, let's do this. That it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. In other words, let's pay attention. And here's where we find our answer. In this, these words that are meant to be a witness forever. He says in verse 15. For thus saith the Lord, God, the Holy One of Israel. In returning, listen, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust, shall be your strength. But you were unwilling. Notice what he says. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. In other words, it's when we return or draw nigh to him, draw near to him and do what? And rest and rest in his presence. It's when we do this that we are seeking intimacy. And he says, he says also in quietness, or maybe you say silence, or in stillness, and trust, that's where we'll find our strength. That's where we'll find our strength. Notice, draw closer to me. You come to me, And in doing so, you rest in my presence, in quietness and trust. Think about it. That's what it takes to do that. In this moment, in doing these things, you will find your strength. So part of pursuing intimacy with God is through what? Rest and quietness, or should we say stillness and silence. Did you hear that? in stillness, and in silence. See, intimacy demands that we enter this place where the Spirit dwells within us. 
There's no coincidence that James says, listen, draw near to God, and he does what? He draws near to you. And if you look at this context earlier, he says, don't you think? You think that it's foolish? Don't you think that it means something, the fact that God is jealous of the spirit that he has caused to dwell within us? And then he goes on to say, God gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself to God and draw near to him. Let's put all of this together. Let's pack all of this together. He is jealous over the spirit that he has caused to dwell within you. Now, there's some argument here as to whether or not he's talking about the Holy Spirit or he's talking about the heart. In my opinion, it doesn't matter because both are valuable, both are important, and in fact, that is where the spirit dwells within us, in our hearts, at the core of who we are. This is the place where time meets eternity, where flesh meets the divine, the, where, where in the stillness of the heart he speaks. It is of the utmost value and importance, and it should be to us. But oftentimes we're like those in Isaiah who are unwilling And then he goes on to say, God gives grace to the humble, so submit yourself to God and draw near to him. What I think we miss about this is that all three of these things deal with matters of the heart. Every single one. Those who are truly humble are humble where? In the heart. They have humble hearts. Those who are truly submissive, those who truly submit Submit in the heart. And those who draw near to God, how is that done? By showing up here on time? You should do that, by the way. Oh, we have a Bible class at 9.30 if you didn't know. Some of you are like, you should not have said that. Ah, just loosen up, Relax. See, now you feel like you have the permission to be, yeah. When we draw near to God, truly draw near to him, it's in the heart. These are all matters of the heart. And our relationship with God is a relationship of the heart. That's true intimacy. That's true intimacy. So how, how do we pursue this thing? How, how do we... How do we I like to talk about it this way. We need to become hermits of the heart. Hermits of the heart. What do we mean by hermit? Well, when you say the word hermit and you hear that, what do you think of? Some outcast, some recluse, someone who is dedicated their whole life to just silence. They have in solitude, right? They have secluded themselves away from society and people. Obviously, that's not what I'm talking about. What do I mean by becoming a hermit of the heart? What I'm talking about is those who learn to remove themselves from the distraction of this world and to enter into this place of this intimacy with God in silence where you open up to prayer, where you prayer becomes a thing where you stop talking and you start listening. Now, as I see it, there are two problems with that. Like, we have a lot of barriers, right? But there are at least two obvious issues that we face when it comes to learning how to, well, do what Jesus did. Go off into the mountains and pray. Silence and solitude. Remove yourself from distractions. And not everybody is willing to go off to the mountains and pray. Not everybody wants to do that. And you don't have to. And you don't have to. So how do I, how do, how do, I do this now where I'm at? Where, where I find myself planted? How, how do I do this? How do I go to that place where he dwells and I can, I can the, the courts of God, or it's in your heart. You dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah, that's where he is. And so how do, how do I learn to go there? <laughs> How do I learn to do this? Well, there are at least two things that we have to address. Two obstacles as I see it. The first is with distractions, right? And the second is our relationship with silence. 
Let's first talk about distractions just for a moment because I really want to get to silence. Distractions. We live in a society where we feel like we always have to be doing something. And in fact, you feel bad when you're just sitting there in silence. In fact, you, you, you feel like you're lazy. And if somebody found out that you were just relaxing, well, you'd feel bad. We live in a society where we feel like we have to fill every moment with something. We have to constantly be doing something. In fact, let's think about this just for a moment. How do you respond when you have to just wait? So you already know. If you're at a doctor's office, right, the first thing you do probably when you sit there and realize you're going to wait for a while is what? You pull out your phone, right? What if you're waiting at a restaurant just to get to the table? Or maybe even after you've gotten to the table and you sit there and wait, what do we typically do? We grab our phones, right? We grab our phones. And you, you got your lovely bride right across the, the seat from you. You can't speak to her. You just rather look at your phone, right? We grab our phones. Like, we, we don't know what to do when there's nothing for us to do. We don't know how just to relax, which is why you need a vacation from your vacation. And you never get a vacation. I tell you, I see it all the time. When you're sitting at a table and you're waiting for a meeting to start, you know what happens? Everybody pulls out their phone and they distract themselves until the meeting starts. And when the meeting starts, they put their phone away. But if the meeting's boring, they pull the phone back out. We do that in church, right? We're distracted. This is boring. It's not speaking to us. So we pull out our phones, right? We don't know what to do when there's nothing to do. The second thing is this. Silence and our relationship with silence. How do you feel? Maybe you're on the train, you're at the doctor's office, and you don't have your phone, you forgot it, or the battery died. Or you let your kid have it so they can distract themselves and leave you alone. And you're sitting there with strangers, and nobody's saying anything. You feel it? It's kind of weird. We, we feel like we have to say something, right? Like somebody's got to make some noise. Like there's a reason why we have to have the TV on when nobody's watching it. Or a fan to go to sleep. I'm guilty. A fan to be able to go to sleep at night, right? Because we can't stand the silence. It's very unsettling and uncomfortable. And it, we don't know how, how, how to deal with that. It's, it's awkward. It's just weird. And it just like distractions. Like we have to have something at every moment, right? Background noise. We feel like we have to fill every moment with noise. In fact, there was some research done and uh, two different studies. Uh, one of them basically presented to us and made us realize that we have grown up with noise in the background. Most of the noise that we've grown up with is what was referred to as the third parent, that is the TV, right? And in fact, in fact, we're so accustomed to it Okay, that it, it, social media came along and that was nothing. That was, that was, we, were, we were primed and ready for it because we grew up. In fact, it was our parents and our great-grandparents that, well, we grew up going to their homes and the TV was always on. And especially if your grandparents can't hear, it is super loud, Right? Like, we grew up with that. We grew up that way. And so this isn't like a new age social media millennial thing. This is an age-old problem thing. Like we grew up with this noise in the background. So much so that there was research done at, at a college where they, they put together like five or 600 students. And one of the, two of the things that they, they, they learned about this was <sighs> students had a very difficult time very, very difficult time doing work 
in silence. They felt like they couldn't get anything done. In fact, some of them felt very agitated and frustrated when it was silent. And in fact, they couldn't concentrate because there was no noise. They didn't know what to do with it. The other thing that we learned from that is that these behaviors were learned. These aren't natural. I see that as a plus. Because if they're learned, we can unlearn them. And that's a huge benefit. And that's the thing that we're going to continue to explore as we progress through this series. And so you receive your, 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 your Devo during the week or during Sunday and you have your challenge and that's what these challenges are about. Helping us understand what it means to come to that place of rest and quietness and stillness and wrestle with it, right? Wrestle with it. But as we, as we wrap up, here's what I want you to understand. Here's what you need to remember. Intimacy with God demands that we create this space for silence. Intimacy demands it. Silence. When I say silence, we're talking about just simply this. The absence of intentional sound. What does that mean? The things that you can turn on and turn off. We're talking about dealing with it in our own environments because it's, it's impossible to remove all the sound. Even if you turn everything off in the house, and what you're going to hear? When the AC kicks on. Or the neighbor's AC because it's practically right next to yours. Are you going to hear the cars drive by? Right? Are you going to hear the humming noise from lights like this? Right? There's always going to be some sound. And so what we're talking about here is the sound that you have the power to turn off or turn on. We're talking about intentionally stopping and resting, right? And, 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 and seeking. Where being still really opens you up and prepares you for prayer. And a prayer that goes beyond just talking. Sure, you're going to talk. That's a part of a relationship, right? There's not much of a relationship if there's no talking going on. Yeah, but see what ultimately intimacy does? I can sit next to my wife and not say a thing. And she knows exactly how I feel. And she understands exactly what's going on. And intimacy with God does the same thing. It opens us up for real prayer. Where prayer is not just talking, but prayer is also, also listening. It's a place where we learn to let go of the resistance and be, as Isaiah 30, 15 says, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. As we wrap this up, we're going to take one minute and I'm going to walk you through Walk you through a little exercise, okay? Because when it comes to this, a lot of us don't know what to do. We're not sure how to manage this, right? And when, we, when I talk about silence and, and quietness, don't think of time. Because it's not about how long. It's about quality over quantity, okay? It's about consistency. And that's it. And so, for this moment, I want everybody just to close your eyes, okay? Whatever posture you would typically take just to relax. If you want to look at me and my beautifulness, you can. Just, just, just do whatever you have to do to be present in this moment. Let's all take a, a deep breath. Settle in, in your seats, okay? Let's take another deep breath. Relax your face, your shoulders, your hands. Feel your feet. Feel the floor beneath your feet. Feel your seat. And for this moment, I want you to pay attention to your breathing. Every breath you breathe you breathe the name of God. Yahweh. 
That breath is your very life. That's our life force from him. Because in him we live and move and have our very existence. So pay attention to your breath. Let's just sit in this moment for a few seconds. If you find your thoughts begin to distract you, just come back to this thought. Your breath. Father, teach us to remove ourselves from the distractions of this world and spend moments like this in your presence, honoring you, respecting you, worshiping you, acknowledging your presence within us. And within you, we literally have our very existence, the very breath that we breathe is from you. Help us seek those moments where we can come, even even if it's just for a minute. Remind ourselves, ground ourselves, settle ourselves in your presence. Reminding us that you're with us, never leave us, and never forsake us. And when situations happen that cause us to react, help us to come to this place. Seek wisdom to intentionally respond. Teach us to remove ourselves from the distractions of this world, to return to you in quietness and stillness, and in doing so, displaying our trust in you. From there, we find our strength. Teach us to do this every day. In Jesus, we pray. Amen.